117th commencement ceremony and convocation of Clarkson University is herewith in session. Now it is time to give something back to the university that has offered us so much. Clarkson has a long-standing tradition where the seniors give a gift back to the university. This year, our class has committed to the donation of an outdoor fire pit that will be installed outside of the new student center. I would like to thank the class for your participation, as well as the other class officers, Alex Cummings, Christy Klein, Carolyn Orth, Robert Pritchard, and Zaid. Sorry, Zaid. <laughs> I would also like to thank our advisors, Rachel Bullock, Suzanne Coutts, and Nicole Thomas for their help and guidance. On behalf of the class of 2010, I am now honored to present Clarkson University with our senior gift. President Collins, will you please join me at the podium? Okay. All right. President Collins, on behalf of the class of 2010, I am pleased to present you with a check for $35,072 for the installation of the fire pit. This is the largest amount any senior class has ever raised. Well, that was amazing, Crystal. Thank you. Uh, I can't tell you how much the institution appreciates, uh, as much as the amount, the spirit that goes behind raising such an enormous sum of money from a graduating class. Thank you uh, from everyone on the stage and every, every other community member at, at Clarkson. Uh, really an amazing gift for us. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, graduates, parents, families, friends, trustees, faculty members, and honored guests. On behalf of the university, I extend a warm Clarkson welcome to everyone. Each graduating class has its own character. Certainly each is special yet distinctive. This year's class has its full share of academically and athletically talented members. They will be attending the best graduate schools in the country and some have already started your own businesses. We know they have a lot of school spirit, so thank you again. To the families and friends of the graduates, this is your day too, because completing college and earning a degree is an achievement that requires extensive family and friend support. Today we have graduates from 18 nations around the globe, from Canada to China, from India to Iran, from Japan to Jordan, from Kenya to Korea, from Nigeria to Nepal, and from Romania to Russia. And there are also 34 states of the nation at State of the Union represented with us today. Now, in the last few years, I have focused my comments at commencement on the commitment and sacrifice displayed by parents, grandparents, and others who support our students on their journey to this day. And of course, they're critical. It is always apparent that there is a sense of deep gratitude on the part of our graduates for all of the support that they have received from their families and friends. Today, I would like to reflect on the spirit of commitment and support, as well as the appreciation of it, but from a different perspective. On Thursday evening, we gave the President's House a name. From this point forward, the Clarkson University's President's Residence will be known as Foster House, named for Rhett and Judy Foster, in appreciation of the commitment and the support they have both given to Clarkson University. Rhett was the chair of our Board of Trustees, never very good at these things, for almost five years until he recently passed away from an aggressive cancer. Some of our graduates actually had the opportunity to know him. The naming of the house after the Fosters led me to two conclusions that I want to share with you. But first, some background. Almost three years ago, 
The Clarkson Student Senate had a powerful vision to create a new building, a place where students could meet, communicate, socialize, share and collaborate, a place that would literally be the center of campus life. The vision was a powerful one, but with many obstacles to overcome and to implement, it would require full board commitment and support, those behind me. Rhett Foster readily took up the challenge and with unremitting energy and drive quickly convinced our board, many of whom are on the stage today, that building a student centre was the right project at the right time. It would transform the fabric of the life of the campus. When you walk outside today and look to the south, you will see the result of a unique partnership of our students with our board. Completion is on schedule for August, and while this class will not have the opportunity to experience it as undergraduates, and believe me, we tried hard to get it for you in time, it will hopefully be a source of pride in your university when you return as alumni. So back to my two conclusions. The first is that a powerful vision presented to the right leader, in this case, that leader being Rhett Foster, can propel a vision forward in ways that can have dramatic impact. Be that leader in your lives. That is Clarkson's tradition. The second conclusion is that you should never miss a chance to say thank you. When Red Foster's health dramatically declined in January, he left his home just once and that was to visit Clarkson. I will never forget wheeling him into the student center in a wheelchair in his spontaneous applause as he saw the spectacular interior of the building. That afforded me the chance to thank him. Don't wait to thank those who help, help you along the pathways of your lives. The university was founded as a memorial to a humanitarian businessman, Thomas S. Clarkson. When he died, a saddened neighbor wrote in, the di in his diary, everybody's best friend is gone. The neighbor wrote that all people should, and I quote, endeavor to do as Mr. Clarkson has done, not live entirely for ourselves, but to try to help others. I conclude with a challenge, a charge to each of the graduates as you depart today. You have earned a degree that will open doors for you. Use it also to open doors for others. You have gained powerful skills, Use your power wisely and with compassion for humankind. The humanitarian spirit of Thomas S. Clarkson places an invisible stamp on every Clarkson diploma. Let the humanitarian spirit that created Clarkson guide and energize your life beyond this campus in this day. And may you defy convention, for you are the hope of the future. Thank you. And now we will continue with the special honours and awards. The first students we seek to recognise today are graduates in the University Honours Program. Will the members of the University Honours Program pr please rise to receive recognition and remain standing? The University Honours Program, please. Keep standing. The commencement program lists the names of members of the graduating class whose academic records have justified, in the eyes of the faculty, their being singled out for distinction or great distinction. Will the graduates who re have received great distinction please rise for recognition and remain standing? Those with great distinction. Now will those who earn distinction please rise so we can recognize all of you. Please rise with distinction. Thank you, please be seated. 
I'd also like to acknowledge 20 graduates who were commissioned as officers in the United States Army and Air Force during the ROTC commissioning services yesterday. Events in recent years have made us all very much aware of the courage and sacrifice that are part of these military commitments. Will all of our new officers please rise and be recognized? Now, I was a little distracted myself because I was watching my wife over there and she's disappeared. <laughs> and we are, I believe, going to have a special visitor that wanted to come and congratulate this class. That is uh, the senior United States Senator uh, for New York, uh, Senator Charles Schumer. And so he is, I think, landing. That's the reason my wife left. And we think that he'll be here in about 10 minutes or so and we'll sit on that seat. Uh, so he is on a tight schedule, but truly wanted to come and congratulate you. So we will move forward um, and slide the senator into the process. Thank you, Jill. We now move to the principal business of the day. The first degrees we award are the honorary doctorates. Candidates for these degrees have accomplished deeds in their careers that are most worthy of, of imitation by today's graduates. As each honorary degree is awarded, the, re the recipient will share with the graduates a thought for consideration in shaping their futures. Our first honorary degree recipient is Martin J. Fisher, escorted by trustee John Lang. Bad D. Clarkson, distinguished professor Philip Hopke, the, the Bayard D. Clarkson Distinguished Professor, Phil Hopke, will present Mr. Fisher. For his remarkable vision and his innovative approach to alleviating poverty in Africa and the developing world by bringing together the power of technology and the entrepreneurial spirit of the world's poor and his steadfast commitment to sustainability and the use of technology to improve society and serve humanity, we proudly honor Martin J. Fisher. By virtue of the authority vested in me, I confer upon you, Martin J. Fisher, the degree of Doctor of Science, together with all the rights, privileges, responsibilities, and honors which appertain thereto. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Clarkson, for all this recognition. It's a great honor to receive this degree, but the bigger honor is to share this day with all of you. Graduation. Wow. Congratulations. You guys have made it. And scary as it might be, you're now moving on to the rest of your life. But what will your future bring? Will it live up to your exp ex excuse me? Will it live up to your expectations? And will it live up, live up to the expectations of others? Especially, will it live up to the expectations of those who work so hard to nurture and care for you? I grew up, as I am sure most of you have, with caring and loving parents who only wanted their children to be happy and succeed in life. But my father was a world-famous physicist. And we grew up knowing what succeed meant. It meant we had to be successful academic physicists. In fact, to even qualify for my family, you needed a PhD in physics. Now, I was always okay at science. What I really liked to do was travel, explore, and build things. I even thought about going to hotel school so I could live in exotic places and meet exotic women. <laughs> but I thought again, and I decided to study engineering. Now, my father taught physics and chemistry. So I decided I better study either chemical engineering or engineering physics. And in freshman year, I did right. I got a lot of, a lot, got a lot of A's and B's. But in sophomore year, I took physical chemistry. 
and I got a C minus. So I switched to mechanical engineering. <laughs> now, I also graduated, but I found I still didn't really know what I wanted to do when I grew up. And that physics PhD was still calling me. So I went to graduate school, and I studied for a PhD in mechanical engineering. But to ensure that I stayed in the family, I did my research in applied physics. Now, to be honest, I didn't learn so much physics, but I did learn how to design and run my own projects. And even more importantly, I learned how to think critically and how to ask the right questions. My paper is all out of order. <laughs> Super. <laughs> so now I have to wing it. <laughs> um, here we go. But I soon discovered that the more education I got, actually the fewer jobs I was qualified to do. And when I finished my PhD, the only job offers I had were either that I could go teach at a university, or I could work in a weapons lab, or I could work for big oil. Now, being young and idealistic, none of these things really excited me too much. So for the first time in my life, OK, I was a bit slow, I asked myself, if I could do anything I wanted to, what would I become? And the answer was, I would work for National Geographic as a photographer. Now, <laughs> the only trouble with that plan is I didn't own a camera, <laughs> and I didn't know anything about photography. So instead, I went to Peru, and I went trekking in the mountains. And there, for the first time, I came face to face with real poverty. And I really felt that poverty. And I decided I would try to do something to help the poor, see if I could. So against my father's advice, I applied for a Fulbright Fellowship to go to Kenya. And I wanted to study the relationship between technology and poverty. I went down there for 10 months, and I stayed for 17 years. And what I found in Africa was all the things that we've all heard about about Africa, it really is the very poorest place on the earth. 45% of the people there really do live on less than a dollar a day. And in fact, most of them are living on more like 25 cents, 50 cents a day. And 40% of them go to bed hungry every single night. And the saddest thing is that despite the billions of dollars of aid that we've spent in Africa, things were getting worse not better. But I hoped that I could help. So I volunteered to work at a nonprofit. No, my fancy PhD did not help me. They were not impressed. I still had to volunteer. And I spent the next five years doing all the typical things that nonprofits do in Africa. We installed community water points. We built schools. We gave things away to poor families. And we told ourselves and the world that we were empowering the poor. But somehow, I really wasn't convinced. And I asked the questions that no one seemed to want to ask. Were we really making a difference? And sadly, the answer was no. My projects, like the vast majority of others, failed to lift people out of poverty, and they had almost no lasting impacts. So I kept asking the questions, and I kept learning from my mistakes. And the most important thing that I learned was a very simple truth about poverty. A poor person's number one need anywhere in the world is only one thing, a way to make more money. Why? Because just like us, they live in a cash economy, and they need money for everything, to buy food, to buy clothes, to buy farm inputs to pay for healthcare, to pay for education, 
In fact, just like us, if they have a way to make money, they can get all these things. And if they don't, they never will. And I also learned that the poor are extremely hardworking and entrepreneurial. Guess what? They have to be just to survive. They're not looking for handouts. They were looking for opportunities. So my friend Nick Moon and I started Kickstart. Kickstart is a nonprofit with a mission to take millions of people out of poverty. And we do this by identifying very profitable business opportunities that millions of people could start with a very small amount of money. We then design the tools and very low cost equipment that they need to start these businesses. And we mass produce this equipment and we mass market it to very poor but entrepreneurial people in Africa. They buy the equipment, they start a new business, they make a lot of money, and they lift their families out of poverty. Now in Africa, 80% of the poor people are poor rural farmers, and our best-selling devices are human-powered irrigation pumps. Because with irrigation, these farmers can move away from rain-fed subsistence agriculture where they wait for the rain that comes once a year and they all grow the same crop at the same time, to commercial irrigated agriculture, where they can now bring out high value crops and sell them throughout the year. And for the first time, they can make enough money to feed and educate their families and have enough left over to invest in their futures. And today, over 100,000 families in Africa are using our equipment to do just that. But now I'm supposed to leave you with some parting advice. So firstly, never be, hand, never be handcuffed by the expectations of others. Most likely, all they really want anyway is for you to be happy. Secondly, always allow yourself to chase your dreams. Learn how to use that camera. And value and use your education. If you have a chance to get more, go for it because one person with an education really can make a difference. And if you get an opportunity to work on one of the world's biggest problems, take it. And if you don't, then ask yourself, what can I do to make the world a better place? And finally, whatever you do in your life, always ask the tough questions and tell yourself, there must be a better way and I can find it. And then go out and make it happen. Good luck. Our second honorary degree recipient is J. Craig Vanto, who will be escorted by trustee Larry Delaney, class of 1957. Presenting Dr. Vanto is Ken Wallace, assistant professor, associate professor of biology. For his pioneering work unlocking the secrets of the human genome, and his continued commitment to using genomic science to find solutions to the world's environmental and energy challenges, and for a lifetime dedicated to the pursuit of knowledge through the rigorous application of science, we proudly honor J. Craig Ventner. By virtue of the authority vested in me, I confer upon J. Craig Ventner the degree of Doctor of Science together with all the rights, privileges, responsibilities, and honors appertaining thereto. I used a paper clip to keep mine in order. <laughs> at, at least so far. So, uh, President Collins, uh, uh, Senator, uh, fellow honorees, honored guests, graduates, families, and friends, uh, it's a privilege to be here with you on the 117th commencement of Clarkson and to accept this honorary degree and to share this important day with all of you. This is an important milestone in each of your lives. Uh, you're graduating with what I consider the most important skill, the ability to learn and to assess new information. I've hoped, unlike most of the nation, you've also learned evidence-based decision-making so you can make smart choices as you go forward in life. I hate to say it literally in front of your professors, 
but much of what you've learned in the course of your formal education will be proven to be wrong during your lifetimes. <laughs> Making constant learning an essential part of your lives. The world in which you and your children will be the leaders will be not the world your parents lived in. We're facing a new set of circumstances never faced before by humanity. I was born in 1946, when the population was much smaller than it is today. Now there's over three people on the planet for everybody that existed the year I was born, and soon there'll be four. Population estimates show that we'll go from over 6.7 billion to over 9 billion people on the planet in the next 40 years. We've overfished the oceans while we fill the seas with plastic. We wage war over oil and religion, yet we cannot provide the basic necessities of life, sufficient food, clean water, shelter, medicine, and fuel for the existing population. How are we gonna do this for the new populations as it continues to expand? Well, today is a day of reflection on all that you've accomplished, all that you and your family and friends have sacrificed and worked for, it's also the start of the most challenging part of your lives. You're at that fork in the road when you must decide which path to take now that you're armed with your degrees. By path, I mean what kind of life you'll live and what you're gonna give back to the world. Will you be committed and passionate about change in the world? Or you merely, will you merely accept what you've been given? Will you be the ones who are later in your lives feel you've made a difference? or you'll be one of the majority wishing you might have done something more with your life. I hope for the sake of all of us, you'll be committed to helping to change the world. In my autobiography, A Life Decoded, I write about my mentor, uh, the late Nate Kaplan, who was a noted biochemist. Among the many important lessons he taught me was the one that helped me guide, guide me through my research uh, career. And it's one of the most important principles. He said, most researchers are afraid of failure or of taking a risk, so they talk themselves out of doing the critical experiments. Don't be afraid to try. I've tried to follow his advice and think I've been successful only by taking risks that other people consider to be extremely significant, from competing with the government to sequence the human genome, or our new work on creating new species, new life forms, that can sequester carbon dioxide and turn that carbon dioxide into new re re renewable uh, fuels. So why risk failure and criticism? The answer, I hope, is obvious. So that you can make scientific advances or medical breakthroughs, devise new computing programs, write important literature, reach a child through your teaching, create new sources of fuel designs, design new methods, for generating clean water, understand how to stop coral reefs from dying, design new zero carbon buildings, and the limitless other things that you can accomplish if you just take those first steps. It, it may be a cliche here with your university motto of defy convention, but take it to heart. Congratulations and good luck. Our third honorary re degree recipient is Carl B. Mack, who will be escorted by trustee Mary K. Woods, class of 1982. Presenting Mr. Mack is Owen Brady, Professor of Humanities. For his leadership and resolute commitment to social justice and the success of African Americans, and his unwavering dedication to empower individuals through education, and to increase the number of unrepresented groups in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and math through the development of young minds, we proudly honor Carl B. Mack. By virtue of the authority vested in me, I confer upon you, Carl B. Mack, the degree of Doctor of Science, together with all the rights, privileges, responsibilities, and honors appertaining thereto.
humbled beyond belief, and so I certainly want to say thank you to the president, President Collins, or as one of the brothers who was passing by uh, affirmed to me that he was a good brother because they gave him a nickname, and it was President TC. <laughs> the Board of Trustees, thank you so much for such an honor. Uh, Mr. Brady, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Brady, thank you so much for your hospitality and hosting my family and I. And to my Clarkson National Society of Black Engineers family, I stand here today because of you. Uh, and Vicki Clark, you have been a phenomenal, phenomenal advisor. I wish we can clone you and place you all over the world. Many of our problems will be solved. So I thank you. Uh, my staff in Alexandria, Virginia, my mentor and advisor who has, been, who has meant so very much to me, and I've gotten word that maybe at the time of my remarks, he may no longer be with me, but he will always be with me in spirit. Dr. Edward Jones from Seattle, Washington. And two very good friends who have come to be here with me this evening, uh, Rich Rosen and Karen Rosen. I love you both, so thank you. And then my family, the lady from Mississippi, Rose Mack, who helped raise me. <laughs> and I love you, and there's a lesson that she has given me that I want to share with you. My daughter, LaShondra Johnson, who has made me so proud as a physical therapist. My wife, Jamie O, a chemical engineer whom I met and within two hours knew that she was the one and asked her to marry me. And she has blessed me nine years later with two precious sons, Joshua and Jonathan Mack. And my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But the lesson that I want to share with you, please. But the lesson that I wanted to share with you that my mother taught me, and I felt ashamed as I was sitting on the stage, and I think that we should, it, it's not too late for us to correct that. There were two gentlemen who were honored here this evening. They were Professor Emeritus, uh, Professor Fodor, and Professor Cerigo. Cerigo. Can you two please stand? When these gentlemen were honored, I want you to keep in mind, they gave 41 years of service and 36 years of service respectively. I don't know how any of us could have maintained our seats to not show them the ultimate respect of pride of what they have given our University Clarkson. And so please help me because it's not too late for us to show them the ultimate amount of respect with what they have so richly given us, and that is a standing ovation for all of their love and service. Thank you, Clarkson. And so my advice to you today, the graduating class of 2010, is to pursue your greatness. And that greatness means that you're going to pursue something that is bigger than you, something that is far more special than you. And our history of our great nation is filled with men and women who have achieved greatness. And when you go through and recount all of their lives, regardless of what their social economic backgrounds, what their race, there is one common denominator that they all have. All of the men and women in this great nation who have achieved that greatness had this one ingredient, opportunity. For example, Abraham Lincoln is considered a great president because he, he had the opportunity to deal with the issue of slavery in this country. Susan B. Anthony is considered a great woman because she had the opportunity to deal with discrimination that was being harped upon sisters in this country when it came to voting. President Roosevelt is considered a great president because he dealt with one of the most uh, phenomenal uh, issues of depression in this country. Clara Barton is considered a great woman because she had the opportunity to deal with the misfortunes of others and as a result of that later became the founder of the American Red Cross. Mary McLeod Bethune is considered a great woman because with only a dollar and 50 cents, she had the opportunity to deal with the vast void of the lack of education of African-American children. And today, her legacy is that she is now educated 
through her institutions, literally hundreds of thousands of young African Americans. Martin Luther King Jr. is considered a great man in the history of our nation because he had the opportunity to deal with the moral consciousness of America. And so now today, you, the graduating class of 2010, our golden knights, you too have amongst your vast array of opportunities, global warming, alternative energy sources, conservation of land, resources, and wildlife, the growing economic gap between the haves and the have-nots, the devastating impact of our educational system that once had our nation as one of the greatest nations in the world in education, skyrocketing unemployment, an exploding prison population, world relations war, immigration reform, and yes, racism are just some of the opportunities that await you for your greatness. Now, Golden Knights, I don't contend to say to you that any of these opportunities are easy. Thus, you must approach the rest of your life with a passion as you face these opportunities. And when I talk to you about passion, I'm not talking about that emotional kind of passion that I have for my beautiful wife, Jamie Yo. I'm talking about a type of passion that is irrational it's irresistible in its desire to create a motive of action within a person to make a betterment for mankind. That is the kind of passion of which I speak. So Golden Knights, I want you to approach your opportunity with pride, the same type of pride that we shown to our brother, Professor Emeritus. That is the type of pride that I want us to show. Not that it has to be our accomplishments, but that even if it was the accomplishments of one of our classmates, for instance, Jason and Andrew, these brothers have shown tremendous academic proudness. And again, the graduating class, you should have came to your feet with pride because their success is our success. That is the type of pride of which your brother speaks to. My golden knights, I need you to approach your opportunity, not with the selfishness, but I need you to approach it with the idea of servant leadership as defined in Mark the 10th chapter, the 35th verse. You remember when James and John came to Jesus and they recognized Jesus as this new king of Israel and they say a paraphrasing, if you will, brother, can we sit on the right and the left hand of your throne? And Jesus said, paraphrasing, my brothers, I can't give you those positions. He who is greatest among you shall be your servant and he who is greatest of all shall be servant of all. So I ask that you approach your opportunity with that of servant leadership. So if by chance you are to embrace all of these tools, those are the tools of passion, pride, and servant leadership, you now have all the right ingredients to be a visionary. And that visionary is somebody who is going to look into tomorrow and see a better day. And I would say to you, Clarkson, our golden knights, you cannot you cannot ever profess to have passion and leave something the same way you found it. Just like this graduating class came here and, and bestowed upon our great university the highest gift of any class, that is passion. You gave this university something that it had never been given by a group of your liking before, that is passion. I have seen it within our organization, one of the Chicago Six that we affectionately known and know as Brother Founder. In 1975, he had a passion to make sure that he could help increase the number of African Americans in the field of engineering. So in 1975, what started off as six members, today is over 33,067 members. That is passion, my golden knights. It is better than when he found it. And so I want to share with you that as you pursue your opportunity, there will be challenges along the way. And I want to share with you this personal story of, of what happened with me. When I was in Seattle and I was working as an engineer with Metro of Seattle, I also served as president of the Seattle King County branch of the NAACP. And I got arrested for protesting what I considered was unlawful law enforcement. Make no mistake about it. I have a great deal of respect for the men and women who put their lives on the line for us every day. But there are some who wear that uniform that I am a little troubled by. So with my passion, 
with servant leadership, humility, I protested the killing of African-American men at the hands of what I considered was unlawful law enforcement. Now, my passion led me in a various precarious position. I got arrested. <laughs> and I want to tell you something. When that jail cell closed, bam! All of a sudden, it wasn't Hollywood and it wasn't sexy to me no more. I was sitting in that jail cell thinking to myself as a young engineer with a very young family and a very old and healthy mortgage, who is going to help me through this situation? I became afraid and I began to question whether or not I did the right things. And right at that moment, when everything was swirling, I was in a state of confusion, questioning and doubting whether or not I should have taken this opportunity. There was a very common voice that came over me from history to remind me that this road wasn't easy. And that voice said this to me. I don't want to give you the impression that it's going to be easy. There can be no great social gain without individual pain. Before the victory for brotherhood is won, some will have to get scarred up a bit. Before the victory is won, some more will be thrown in the jail. Before the victory is won, some, like Mega Evers, may have to face physical death. But if physical death is the price that some must pay to free our children and our brothers from an eternal psychological death, then nothing can be more redemptive. Before the victory is won, some will be misunderstood and called bad names. But we must go on with the determination and with the faith that this problem can be solved. And so I say to you, class of 2010, my golden knights, don your intellectual armor that has been presented to you by our great university. Bring forth your sword of change. Make sure that your heart is wrapped with that of servant leadership so that when you chase this opportunity, you don't chase it for fame and greatness. You chase this opportunity so that you can make a difference in the lives of others. And when you go with such sincerity in your heart, I can assure you that you would be successful. And I can assure you that history shall remember your greatness. God bless you all. Senator, it's going to be a tough act to follow. <laughs> With that, uh, we're very pleased to get a call that uh, the, the senior senator, senior United States senator for New York, uh, Senator Charles Schumer, wanted to come by and give his personal congratulations to this class. And so, with that, Senator, the microphone is yours. Well, thank you, President Collins. Thank you for the great job you do for Clarkson. And I want to thank everybody, the faculty, the staff, the people who come late at night and keep the place clean, everybody who makes this institution the great institution that it is. I want to congratulate the honorary degree winners, families, Friends of the graduates, but most of all, I want to congratulate you, the class of 2010 Clarkson. Congratulations on graduating from one of the great institutions, not only in New York, but in our country. Now, first, I'd like to announce my class gift. As you all know, it's hard to pay for college and graduate school. And if you're poor, the federal government helps you out. But the middle class struggles as well. And so I passed a law two years ago that says that either you or your family, whoever paid for college, graduate school, gets a tax credit, which means they can fully take off their federal taxes $2,500 for each year of college or graduate school for each child, provided your family income is below $200,000 a year. 
So graduates, if you come from a family that makes less than 200,000, make sure they take that deduction in tax time. About a quarter of all people, because it's new, who are entitled to it, don't take it. And if you come from a family who makes over $200,000 a year, God bless you. <laughs> now, graduates, today is, of course, a major turning point in your lives. And there are going to be people, usually older people, who tell you that your college years are the best years of your life. And I'm sure that you, having stayed up all night to write that last paper, having crammed for that last final, are praying that they're wrong. Well, they're right and they're wrong. You'll probably never find a better late snack than the slice of pizza from Little Italy. You'll probably never taste a better beer than the drafts at McDuff's, for those of you over 21. And you will probably, seriously, never meet another group of friends who see you grow and mature and learn so much as the friends you've made here at Clarkson. But it is true that the best times of your life are beginning. And you know, these are tough times. We have a tough economy. High unemployment, a great recession. Tough times, we see the scourge of terrorism. And at the same time, there are people your age, brave young men and women overseas, protecting our freedom. So these are difficult times, indeed. But you know what? Americans, and particularly young Americans, New Yorkers, and particularly young New Yorkers, and Clarkson graduates, when times are tough is when you really stand up. And so now is the time, if there was ever one, to reach for your dream, and then to reach deep down inside yourself and see what you're made of. My advice to this great class of 2010 is very simple. Go for it. Now, sometimes you'll make the wrong choice, but if my experience is any indication, you'll pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and go forward. But if you make the right choice, with a lot of hard work, a little luck, and some prayer, your life will be renewed and enriched forever. Now, I learned these experiences myself. When I was sitting like you are, graduating from college, I had just learned that I had won a scholarship to travel all around the world, all expenses paid for a whole year. For me, it was the opportunity of a lifetime. I had never been out of the country before. But at the same time, and also for the first time in my life, I had met a girl and I had fallen in love. Well, I had to decide. Do I go around the world on the scholarship? Or do I stay home with the girl? <laughs> I stayed home with the girl. <laughs> Wait, don't applaud yet. The story unfolds. She went on a brief vacation that summer, and I went to the airport to meet her on her return. As soon as she got off the plane, I saw by the look on her face something was wrong. She dumped me by Labor Day. <laughs> there I was. No scholarship. No trip around the world. No girl. I said to myself, what a loser you are. I stayed in my house for months. I didn't know what I'd do with myself, but somehow I picked myself up, dusted myself off, and moved forward. And a few years later, I found myself seated once again at graduation, this time from law school. And like so many of you, my parents were seated behind me, proud as could be. But on the way home from after graduation, I told mom and dad that I was not going to join the big fancy law firm like we had planned. I told them I was going to run for public office. I love politics. My parents were shocked. My mother was particularly disappointed. My parents had struggled to help me get through college and law school. They wanted the best for me, and the firm was paying $400 a week more than my family had ever seen. But my heart wasn't in it. I had worked there the previous summer. I hated it. And I love politics. So that fall, 
I ran for the New York State Assembly at the age of 23. I had three opponents. There was the machine party candidate, everyone thought he'd win. There was a neighborhood activist. And then there was my mother who was telling all her friends not to vote for me. So I'd get this dumb idea being a politician out of my big, thick head. Well, a few years earlier, I didn't get that girl. But that November, I won the election. So, graduates of this great class, Clarkson 2010, go for it. And when you have doubts, and you know, we all have doubts. It's, it's just a part of the human condition. But when you do, maybe you'll, maybe you'll remember a few lines from this poem by Rudyard Kipling. It's called If. He wrote it to his son a hundred years ago, but it's very relevant to each and every one of you today. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same, if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, or watch the things you gave your life to broken, and stoop and build them up with worn out tools, if you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on a turn of pitch and toss and lose and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss, if you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone and so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue or walk with kings but not lose the common touch, if neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all count with you, but none too much. If you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that's in it, and which is more, you'll be a man, my son. He wrote it to his son a hundred years ago. It's relevant to each and every member of this great class of 2010. To Clarkson 2010, good luck, Godspeed, and most of all, go for it.